But we're back, episode two of the No Excuse podcast. And we're here today at Max Events. Um, this is one of the episodes, all the, the podcast supporters, they've given us access to some land, some quads, some shotguns. So this is pre-film, and we're gonna have a little bit of a giggle on the quads, and then we'll get into filming the podcast today. Today's episode, uh, I introduce you to a former military helicopter pilot. He flew three operational tours of Afghanistan as a British Army Apache attack helicopter pilot which I think just happens to be one of the coolest jobs in the world. He's also flown the Puma helicopter for the Royal Air Force. After 17 years military experience, he left the military to start his new company, uh, V-Force Training, providing high-octane, adrenaline-fueled driving experiences for members of the public with a sort of a military and a police theme. Um, outside of that, he has a degree in mechanical engineering. He's a former member of the War Marines Reserve, and he's also a qualified rally driver and rally instructor. And when he has the time, he's also a husband, shares his time between living in Reading and in the Breckens. So today, episode number two, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our first second guest, Mr. Chris Bosper. So before we go any further, I just need a minute of your time so I can share with you my thanks to some of the supporters of the podcast. First and foremost, we're here today at Max Events. Max Events is one of the South's leading providers of outdoor activities and corporate team building and challenge events. If you visit their website at maxevents.co.uk, they very kindly offered us a 10% discount. Mention the discount code NOEXCUSE10 during any telephone calls and hopefully that discount should be coming your way. So a big thanks to Max Events. The quads, the shooting, everything today is provided by Max, Max Events, so thank you very much. Secondly, Triple Nine Coffee. Uh, they're pioneering the way of the coffee in the bag and they've been founded by serving emergency services personnel. Visit their website at triple nine coffee.com. Use the discount code no excuse 10 for your 10% discount there also. Finally, SF, SF Strength, easy for me to say. If you remember in episode one, we interviewed Tony Hayes. He's the founder of the SF1 and SF Strength. If you visit the website there at sfstrength.com, once again, the discount code, no excuse 10 when the website's up and running and he'll honor a 10% discount for anything you buy there. So that's it, onwards to the podcast. Well, it's official. We're back for episode two of the No Excuse podcast. And I'm over the moon to be sat across the podcasting table from none other than former British Army Apache pilot, Mr. Chris Vosper. 
I, you know, I, that's, that was missing a round of applause, I'm thinking, then. All like a drum roll, wasn't it? <laughs> I'd uh, do my own applause if I had well, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm saying welcome, like we've just met, but this has been a day long affair, isn't it? What we started this morning at what time? Seven, seven o'clock, and now Seven-ish. we are at almost quarter to five in the afternoon. So just to give some context around this, prior to the podcast, we we spent a little, probably a little bit too much time actually out on some quads, having some fun, um, doing some shooting. So it was a great icebreaker. Did you enjoy it thoroughly? Yeah, great Ideal. deal. I'm a happy man. Um, but it does mean now we are warmer, and we have been drinking coffee, so I'm good to go. Like all set. Yeah, happy. What I'll say though, Chris, before we get into your conversation, there are just a number of admin points that I want to square away, uh, some of which maybe I should have clarified during episode one. The first one actually though is just prior to uh, recording the podcast today, I did record a quick video thanking some of the podcast supporters, uh, one of which was Tony Hayes, which you may remember as being the guest from episode number one, and Tony's company, SF1 Strength. Tony's very kindly... um, stepped on board as a supporter for the podcast. Now, uh, very much aware that I don't want a former SBS veteran hunting me down and uh, showing me the error of my ways. I did get Tony's company wrong during that thank you. So just to clarify, Tony, that your company is SF1 Strength and your website is sf1strength.com. So anyone listening, uh, take a look at that website. Next up, I will say um, two points, I think probably fueled more by questions that I've received since episode one. Um, but I think it's a good time to talk about it now. It's part of the conversation, I think. So one of those relates to how do I interpret uh, the the tagline almost of leading a no excuse life. And that sort of carries into what was the motivations behind creating a podcast like the no excuse podcast. And I'm very much aware that at this stage that you are here listening to Chris's story. So I don't want to take up too much airtime, but I do think it's important that I at least talk about this for a few minutes. Um, Leading the no excuse life is more, I think, than a a tagline for me. It's more than a a hashtag. It's more than a a social media post or an Instagram post. It's, for me, it's real life. And I know this is going to mean different things to different people, but leading a no excuse life for me really is, it's the daily grind. It's the, it's the, the daily slog of every day trying to make the best of the circumstances that you're in. Now, we're all going to be in a different stage of our life. Uh, We would have seen different things. We would have experienced different things. We have different goals and ambitions. But I think the one important thing is that we can all have an opportunity to live by a set of principles that we set ourselves. And for me, I think one of those principles is to lead a no-excuse life. And now, I'm not saying I'm perfect at that by any means, but it's something that I... I intentionally introduce into my life every day as a means of really holding myself to account. It's a way that I can remind myself every day that I can do better, but there will be some days when I fail miserably. There'll be some days that I do better than others. But for me, it evolves around, I think, associating one, what we're doing today on a podcast, the conversation that we can have with people, the value that we can draw from a conversation, but how over time, I think us as a society and, and the world, we've lost that connection with conversations. And I think it's now it's easier to send a text message than it is to, to send an email or it's easier to send an email than it is to telephone and vice versa. It's far easier to telephone someone today than it is to go and meet them face to face. And so we lose that connection. We lose those little moments in a conversation that are that are important to us. They could be moments of reflection. They could be moments that are motivational or they could be moments where we we stop and we take stock about our lives. And I think that's the powerful thing of conversations. And and part of this this podcast for me about leading that no excuse life is making the decision to really step into as many of those conversations as I can, because I draw huge value from these conversations. Um, And as many of you did during episode one with Tony, I think a lot of people connected with Tony and Tony's story. And I think that is a way of of reaffirming for us here on the podcast that we're going in the right direction and we're doing the right thing. So I'm not sure how well that properly squared away leading a no excuse life, but I think people will always make a judgment call as to taglines. For me though, it's real, it's real life. And it's a, it's a principle that I try to lead my life by every day. Now, before I move on, there are some other things I need to do. Thank yous, I must spend some time thanking some people. Firstly, for those of you really who showed support following episode one, uh, we've been bowled over really by 
the amount of support that Tony and Tony's story received. Um, but I'd also like to pass some thanks from everybody here to those of you that found the strength and the honesty almost to, to direct message us and to talk about where you are in your life right now. Now, we didn't ask for that and I wasn't expecting that, but nonetheless, you did that. And it was humbling, I would say, to be able to listen to some of your stories and to hear where you currently are as, as difficult as some of those circumstances may be. I hope that we we're able to help a little bit in the messages that we gave back to you. But I must emphasize that I, I and others here, we're not trained. We have no qualifications when it comes to counseling or, or giving advice on mental health or the dark times. But nonetheless, we, we have lived a life and we are more than happy to try and share those experiences where we can or try and connect people with other people who may be able to help. So to, to you, I say thank you to everybody. Um, and I'm already getting too tired of my own voice, Chris. So I think it's going to be about time for you to start talking. But for those of you then who've just tuned in and have ignored the last five minutes of me talking, today's guest, Chris Vosper, uh, a good friend of mine, former British Army Apache pilot. And you already know Chris, but you know, you can talk to, to me about helicopters all day. It's, I'm a bit of a helicopter uh, train spotter, if that even makes sense. I'm the sort of person that as you're walking around and I see a helicopter, no matter who I'm with, I have to tell them what sort of helicopter that is. <laughs> but you're the real deal. I'm the one that just pretends to, to like helicopters. So um, again, look, welcome to the podcast, Chris. It's, um, it's a real pleasure that you're here. And I'm glad that you get an opportunity to share your life and some of your life experiences and what you've done and, and what you're doing currently. So I think one thing I'd like to sort of ask you and, and, and take you into a time thinking about being a pilot. Can you remember the exact time or thereabouts when sitting in the, the cockpit of an Apache attack helicopter as the pilot was what you wanted to do? Yeah, uh, so I, I think you can trace that back to age 13. That's, that's when I joined the Air Cadets uh, and I very quickly realised that uh, I, for sure I wanted to be a military pilot and I'd made that my burning ambition in life but prior to that I guess I was just a pretty ordinary kid um, if you'd have asked me what I what I was going to end up doing when I was older or what my life ambition would have been I'd have probably have said something revolving around cars because I'm a big petrol head love cars so either a racing driver a rally driver or a pilot uh, or maybe a soldier those were probably my three big um, things that I was interested in, but I never really had a burning desire. I never necessarily saw myself uh, as as being focused and channeled into doing those things. That just seemed like something way off until a friend of mine suggested that I join air cadets with him. So up to that point, I was probably going to join army cadets and you know, eventually go on to, to join the army. But he... Uh, suggested, convinced me it was worth going along to air cadets with him. And very soon, you know, by the time you know, I was getting the chance to go and fly in the back of helicopters and flying chipmunks and bulldogs and learn about learn about planes and flying, I was absolutely sold on the idea that I wanted, I desperately knew uh, that one day I was going to become a military pilot. And that just became an all-consuming, burning ambition for me. So, you know, from... 13 onwards, I, I completely threw myself into everything that I needed to do to become a pilot. And it was a complete fixation. So was was the Apache on the horizon at that point, though? The Apache wasn't on the horizon. So I, I was interested in helicopters and jets, not, not really interested in, uh, in big transport planes. But I had a fascination for, uh, for helicopters and a fascination for jets. So obviously, probably... Watching Top Gun, watching Airwolf, uh, you know all those influences as, as a kid. Probably listening to my my grandfather's stories uh, as a kid. So he trained as a pilot during the war. Uh, so I guess all these things kind of had a big influence. But um, what really shaped it was not long after joining the Air Cadets at thirteen. I kind of I knew that's what I wanted to do, and the. Yes, the Apache wasn't necessarily on the horizon, but I wasn't specific to what type I was going to fly. Uh, I just knew I wanted to be a military pilot. And at that time, to me, RAF seemed to make the most sense. So I worked as hard as I could, applied myself, and 
uh, threw myself into, into my studies and then did as much as I could with Air Cadets. So that by just after my 16th birthday, I applied to, to the Air Force and did uh, the full officer and air crew selection process to, to get an RF6 form scholarship. And then I was going to finish my levels and then go straight into the Air Force as a pilot. So passing that would have, would have given me uh, a place immediately after school, straight into officer training and then on to flying training. So what happened was, though, I, obviously I did the best I could, prepared as well as I possibly could for it, but I, I, but I was unsuccessful. And that was a really good thing in hindsight because that really, that was the making of me because if I'd have got that, that would have been an easy ticket straight into flying training. And as it was, that kind of forced me to regroup. It taught me a valuable lesson early on of, you know, you might fail at some stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's over. It's actually an eventual you know, success is going to be uh, preceded by several failures, potentially. doesn't matter. You just push through it. You deal with it. You learn the lessons and you keep on going until you've achieved your goal. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty wounding at the time because I really wanted it. And I guess people wouldn't necessarily realise how much of a burning desire somebody could possibly have aged only 16. But, you yeah, know, that was, that was, for me, it became an obsession and then to be denied it took a bit of a regroup and a rethink. Uh, and so had a bit of a sad on for a while, but just you know, took charge of myself, got, got a grip, realised that the next thing I needed to do to still achieve that, that end goal of becoming a military pilot uh, was I was, there were various options, but the, probably the most appealing was to go to university, get sponsorship at university, then get a place at the end uh, and roll straight into to flying training at the end of that. So in order to give myself the best possible chance, obviously I wanted to finish off my levels, do as well as I could there, um, decided that I would, uh, I would take a couple of years off um, before going to university because I was young in my age year group. So I was you know, 16 uh, at, that, at that point. I was uh, the youngest um, in, my, in my age group for that year meant that I could afford to take two years off and do three years at uni and then still be well within the age limit uh, of 23 and a half-ish, uh, which is what the RF pilot limit was at that time. So it worked all that out and it meant that by taking two years off prior to university and filling it full of as many good things as I could, many interesting sort of character developing things um, th so I could then be more impressive to a board to then subsequently get uh, an RAF sponsorship through university. Uh, that to me seemed worthwhile. So I then, uh, I went on an air cadet camp, which was, it was actually an army, army cadet camp for, for more senior cadets, but I was lucky enough to get a slot on it. And, it, and I had a, a Royal Marine officer as my platoon commander and it's funny it's funny how all these you know just chance meeting with certain people certain events in your life kind of can have an enormous impact and this was definitely one of those occasions because that was my first sort of exposure to the Royal Marines at that stage and that just meeting and being under the training of, uh, of this guy for, for just that week-long course had an enormous impact on my life because uh, I now suddenly I knew what a professional, um, tough, fit, uh, you know, charismatic guy you know, that, uh, that he was, was representative of, of what the Royal Marines is like and what, how, um, you know, what, what an incredible ethos and culture it is. And also, it, it um, enlightened me to the fact that you could become a pilot in the Royal Marines, and I didn't realise that. So that opened up a whole avenue of additional things, which led, led shortly after to me joining the Royal Marines Reserves and spending the two years prior to going to university focused in and around that sole pursuit of, of getting my Green Beret, doing the recruit 
um, and, and uh, commando training, finishing up, getting my green berry, uh, and, and then focusing all the other activities into fit around that. So I spent all those two years uh, prior to university doing you know, a number of um, interesting and enjoyable things. And, uh, and actually, I think by the time I, I got, to, got to university, just turned 20, I'd done, I'd done a lot and I felt that I, I was able to, I had the confidence to go to a board having you know, full justification. Like I think, I, yes, at 16, I hadn't really had much to offer for you guys. I can imagine you weren't going to accept me at that point. But now I think things have changed and I've, I've done a lot. And in amongst um, all the, the physical effort um, and so the, the, you know, just absorbing the, the thrashings and the bee stings of, of you know, Royal Marine recruit training, the, the big thing was the quality of the people. So the quality of the staff, the instructors you know, were PTIs, and uh, you know, mountain leaders. There was an ex SAS guy, um, a couple of SBS guys, and you know, guys who'd seen action in the Falklands at seventeen. You know, these were tough, professional guys, and what a, what a privilege to be trained by those guys. But also the peers, the you know, the muckers. I've still got really good mates from those days uh, as a as a young kid getting getting thrashed in my spare time voluntarily. Uh, because that shared adversity builds some some really good, really good friendships, as well as kind of helping you to grow as a as a person, a fully stretch you. Right, I was right on the outside of my my comfort zone doing that. I, you know, it was a, a a real step into uh, a, a new dimension, um, and and it served me really well. And the sense of pride and accomplishment I got from getting getting through commando training. Uh, and earning my green beret was was immense. And like you know, for some guys, they probably didn't have to work quite as hard or dig quite as deep as I did. But that was, yeah, it was so much on the limit of of my physical um, capabilities, my physiological capability, as well as how much sort of effort, discipline, you know, determination it, it kind of tested. That the the reward once I once I achieved it. Was was incredible, but alongside that, I I went to I went to Namibia and spent three months in Operation Rally, uh, on or now called Rally International, um, just doing some ecological work and adventure work and um, helped build a, a school in a little village stuck out in in the sticks in Africa, uh, and getting the you know, getting the opportunity to go and visit that village, see the little mud huts and and the stick huts and. Yeah, that was in itself a great life lesson because where else would I've had the opportunity to do that? And perhaps you know, if I had have joined the Air Force straight away, gone straight into pilot training, all these things that I was embarking on would never have come to be. I also so I I studied a lot. I I did a philosophy and a psychology course at, at university uh, just during those two gap years. Uh, so not full degrees, but just modules of, of degrees, uh, and then I read a lot. I just I, in every in every possible way. So as I was beasting myself physically and trying to get as fit as I could, I was trying to get as um, knowledgeable and, and develop myself in that sphere as well. But equally, yeah, in, just in terms of character and leadership skills. So I did uh, I did TA officer training, running in parallel to that. I. Yeah, I did a flying scholarship, um, worked uh, in a leisure centre briefly, so I did lifeguard training, um, and I did some voluntary work as well, which was which was extremely rewarding. And I would wouldn't have done that before. I wouldn't have even considered to, to have done that. But that yeah gave me an opportunity to see just another aspect of, of life. So helping to um, look after uh, teenagers with with learning difficulties during um, Easter and, and summer breaks, so council led initiatives. Uh, and all these things led to, by the time I'd started uni, I really felt I'd gone from being, you know, just a pretty wet behind the ears, ordinary average kid to actually having accomplished some really, um, sort of, you know, I don't say impressive, not being arrogant about it, I'm j but just real life-changing experiences. And I've definitely grown 
as a as a person. And this, this was all by the age of twenty. Yeah, so I just turned twenty by the time I started I started uni. And if I if I'd have gone straight to uni, smashed that and joined up straight after, again I, I think I'd have missed out on a lot of these elements as well. I think so, because listening in, you know, from the age of sixteen through to twenty, to have achieved all of that in itself is yeah. impressive. So I, it's certainly not something you should step back from. And, you know, you're not being arrogant by talking about it in that way. That's as a reflection on maybe the the career paths that people take of today. As you leave school and you're looking through to college and university, and can you really squeeze this in and around education? I mean, you've 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 capped, capped out of a green beret with the Royal Marines Reserve during this time. Yes. You've studied sub courses at a university. You've volunteered. I mean, you're ticking boxes now that, that I, I imagine a lot of people would probably sit back and think, blimey, I haven't done that in the last 10, 15 years, and you've managed to do all of this in those four years. What, what was the real driving force? Though? I mean, was there, was there an influence in your life at that time that was maybe pushing you in that direction? Or was this single-minded? Was it was just what you wanted? Yeah, it was, I think, being from you know, sort of relatively humble origins being from a pretty ordinary average background and and not being a particularly you know spectacular guy uh, as a candidate to go and uh, join join the uh, the air force in the first place and being knocked back was a real a real motivation to actually up my game and it was all things that were entirely available to to most people if they so wish to commit themselves but the trade-off is that you've got to work hard and you've got to put the effort in and nobody's telling you what you have to do. It's nobody's, nobody was making me rock up on a, every single Friday night to go and spend the entire weekend getting thrashed around uh, Woodbury Common or Dartmoor or whatever. Uh, that was entirely on my own efforts, but all because I was really motivated to achieve that one single aim of becoming good enough to get accepted in, into flying training. But so the interesting thing though was that by the time I started I started uni, uh, I'd originally in, intended up until um, I did that leadership course and had, had that exposure to um, to the Royal Marines, to, which actually opened my eyes to go not just from the RF but to consider the, the Marines and the Army as options uh, to fly uh, and, and have a subsequent career. So. Um, by the time I by the time I turned up to uni, I I was actually more interested in joining the Marines as a pilot, or joining the Army as a pilot because now the Apache was fully on the horizon. Um, then I, then I, I was more interested in those two than I was joining the RAF because I had uh, I'd written uh, written off to then to the to the Air Force to then go and get a uh, university. Um, sponsorship and go through that whole selection process and while I was waiting for them to to reply I just started uni and uh, I joined the Royal Marine Reserve in in Manchester so went went to Manchester University it made sense to just keep keep my hand in. I was so proud of the fact that I just worked my tail off to get my green lid um, I that actually spurred me on to keep that trajectory of you know if I've just done that, what's the next thing I can achieve? This is amazing. Uh, so it wasn't long after that I decided that actually I'm going to I'm going to have a crack at uh, SBS reserve selection in parallel to do my degree. And that's not a decision I, I took lightly because the the knock on from that was that that was basically I was going to have to do that at the expense of any kind of social life. So was, that was going to have a massive impact on. I wasn't going to be you know, just coasting through uni and, and party central, I knew if I was if I was to to take on that challenge, that was going to consume pretty much all my spare time, and I was going to have to work really hard at the degree in order just to you know crack a reasonable pass, not even starring in it. But it was going to take all my effort to achieve both those things in parallel. Um, but I still want to you know have a, a reasonably good time at uni. Why? Why not? You don't just go there to to get a qualification, but um, in in parallel with that, I I then applied to to the army, and I'd already done my reg- regular commissions board, passed that, and had a place at the end of university for Sandhurst, and 
I spent all my spare time pretty much running up and down hills, getting as fit as I could, get hills fit. Um, and there was a, a, a good group of us, all Royal Marine Reservists, uh, who all decided together that we'd, we'd go and have a, have a crack at SBS Reserve Selection. So, uh, And we pretty much went through a series of you know, all the modular training sections. Um, and I spent the entire three years at uni pretty much with all my spare time um, committed to, to learning some skills, getting beasted. And, and it was a yeah, formidable confidence builder by the time I actually turned up at Sandhurst, I I knew I could, I was comfortable. I could cope with almost anything that they were going to throw my way because I'd had to work so hard to to get to that level of uh, of soldiering competence, of physical endurance, uh, and then equally the academic rigor of of knuckling down and, and beasting myself through uni. Uh, which you know it, that didn't come easy. I'm, I, I want to go and I'm a sort of action orientated guy. I didn't necessarily want to be spending all my all my time doing academics. I want to go and didn't want to be in the classroom. I want to be out doing stuff. So you know, I look back. I was in, I was so incredibly focused and disciplined. That's what got me through. But it meant that by the time I started Sandhurst, I was really in a as best a possible shape to to go there and do well and the the reason why that became so important is because so once the army air corps had decided that uh, it was going to go firm on getting the apache i decided that that's what i really wanted to do and it <laughs> i'd uh, i'd then applied to the army air corps after i already got my place uh, at sandhurst and the Air Corps Selection Board, I went down the middle wallop, did, did a few interviews and, and yeah, met the guys, had a few, uh, went through that sort of additional selection process to be accepted into the Air Corps prior to Sandhurst. And uh, I was unsuccessful again. again. <laughs> so uh, the only way that I could then get into the Air Corps as an army, as an army officer was to do so well at the first half of Sandhurst or the first two thirds of Sandhurst that by the time it got to your choice of arm selection interview board that um, I had to have done sufficiently well up to that point so my report at Sandhurst was really good and perform well at that interview. So I really joined with a bit of a gamble that that I could actually, I had to back myself to say that I'm going to throw myself into it so much to the extent that I can... Uh, get a, a reasonably good report good enough to pass and thankfully that that's what that's what came to pass but uh, other guys most other guys I'm sure didn't have to work quite as hard as I did to get that place but actually yeah I'm thankful for that because I had to dig so deep and work so hard to achieve that that these are these are great life lessons and then actually when you work hard for something when you achieve it, it's, it, it feels so much better. It's, it's so much more of an accomplishment. Especially when you've, I suppose you've, as you say, you've, you've not met the grade on a number of occasions. Now, what sort of feedback were you getting at that point? Because, you know, if you fail at something, if you don't know, know what you've, you've failed for, that's a very difficult obstacle to overcome, isn't it? You know, if you're giving yeah. feedback, were you working on feedback? Yeah, so absolutely. So the, the feedback from the Air Corps was that the board were, were impressed with my accomplishments and what I've done. And, yeah, I think I think that's probably fair enough. I'd I'd done a you know a fair bit to to look good on paper. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that in person uh, I was coming across as exactly what they wanted. And also, it's a really popular choice of arm. So lots of people want to become my Mir Corps officers and 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 get to go and fly helicopters. And they can choose who they want. They can be. I thought to be pretty, yeah, uh, pretty picky. I just wasn't good enough. So the feedback was, you know, just you're not bad. You've done a lot on paper, but we've got other better candidates who, um, yeah, we'll choose them over you. So it's like, okay, fine. Then that that then falls to me to perform and do better um, going forward to then demonstrate that I, I'm 
committed i can make i can make the grade i can i can do well enough and thankfully that that is that's how it, that's how it worked out so uh it as i say it didn't make it easy and i guess for a lot of guys who'd just been sort of given it and said right you're you're good enough here's a place on your crack uh would have probably coasted a little bit but that was there was no guarantee even if you'd been accepted into the air corps before going to Sandhurst, that you were still going to get your place. So it happened to a good friend of mine, and he uh, he got an, an air call place, a, a pass, prior to going to Sandhurst, went to Sandhurst, were in the same platoon, um, and didn't perform well enough, uh, frankly, at Sandhurst. Didn't, he didn't make the cut, so they didn't offer him a place. And so he wound up not going to the air call, even though he'd kind of been sponsored by them. Um, Thankfully, three years later, as a, as a cavalry officer, he reapplied uh, and then did get the chance to, to go across the Air Corps on secondment, then eventually um, did enough flying that he left and became a, a civvy helicopter pilot and still is. So it worked out well in the end. But even getting that place beforehand is no guarantee you're going to necessarily uh get offered a place on the on the pilot's course so how be accepted you, by the regiment. by that point by the so, yeah i'd have been 23 by the time i started sandhurst so i graduated at i was 22 just turning 23 so then uh, we're talking halfway through sandhurst by the time we came, came to our choice of on board so yeah 23 so pretty much in those you know What's that? Seven and a half years since being uh, yeah, given the no, you're not going to have an RF uh, six form scholarship. So I'd now come about a lot of learning, a lot of stuff had happened since then. In, 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 I suppose then looking at a lesson, even at that age, if if someone was listening to this right now and thinking that they're determined to become an Apache pilot, it's everything they want to do. Yeah, they're sixteen, they're seventeen, they're just leaving education, or they're thinking about their options now. Um, what, what, could, what advice could you give them at this point? Looking back in hindsight, how could they best prepare themselves? What could they do, they think, to present themselves in the best light? Yeah, that's a good, really good question. It's be absolutely crystal clear that's exactly what you want. And if it is, then you've got to throw yourself at it fully and you've got to absolutely be completely committed to doing everything that's required to make the grade. And that means working hard at school that means you, if you want to join the the RAF just and you're only interested in flying and, and there's nothing wrong with that, I'd thoroughly recommend joining the Air Cadets. You don't have to, but that will give you a huge uh, advantage in terms of understanding uh, the, some of the basic ground school, getting the experience of flying, getting a, either the, a gliding scholarship. Uh, so you, at 16, you get to go, and go gliding and go solo. And all these things are still available, so I'd, rec- I'd thoroughly recommend and advise doing that. Um, if you're super keen, then you go to uh, an air experience flight where you get to go and fly in the tutors. So I, I volunteered as a as an air experience flight pilot late, a lot later on, and spent five years uh, teaching and, and flying air cadets. So that was that, for me. That was, a, that was a great way to to give something back because I knew what it was like being you know that 13 year old kid or that. 16 year old kid who really wanted to be a pilot um, and and be able to offer that advice on a case by case basis and then you can tell so most most cadets don't necessarily have that burning desire but some do and and I could totally resonate with that and totally understand where they, where they were coming from and I would deliberately spend extra extra time giving as much uh, of my you know advice and support as I poss- possibly could even to the extent that I'd try and encourage them to, uh, when when the time was right in their life, to come back to the air experience flight and do extra flying, volunteer as a staff cadet, um, learn as much, get in, get a, a book on private flying, learn as much as they can about that, apply for a, uh, a flying scholarship and try and you know, develop and spend as much time in and around an aviation environment as, po- <coughs> excuse me, as possible. Um, and then on top of that, you, you've got to you've got to understand what is required to pass uh, the the board and what you need to do to prepare for that. And there are 
I guess there's probably a lot more information available online now. But uh, at the time, the, a great source of, um, of that knowledge of what, what the board, the interview questions they were going to ask and what you needed to do to prepare for it was available from, from some of the staff in, in Air Cadets and, uh, and other mates of mine. So uh, guys who I'm still really good mates with the guys that, that I that was sort of in our clique in Air Cadets, uh, some of whom, most of whom actually went on to become uh, in one service or the other, went, went to go and... Um, not just air crew, but went on to military service. And uh, you know, having peers that are a little bit older who've gone through the process and been successful, I would say link in with those guys and get the information and see what they're doing and see what they had to go through and what prep they had to do because that's extremely current information then. Uh, and that would read across to, I guess, anything that you want to apply mm. yourself to. Find a, some mentors, find the right group of people that... Uh, have already demonstrated success in your area of what you're, you're trying to achieve. Um, but I think just putting in the preparation is vital. If you really, really want to do something and, you, and you're smart about what preparation you need to do, then you just knuckle down and work as hard as you can. Then, except if it, if it doesn't work out, that's not the end of it, you just keep going and going and rattling through the failures until eventual success. I think it's really worth noting then that at the end of the podcast, we'll get our heads together and think about maybe some links that people might want to follow if they're interested in becoming yeah. a pilot. We'll put those at the end of the podcast. But yeah. So we're 23 years old now. I say you're 23 years old. Uh, you've been accepted into, what would you refer to as flight school? Is that right? Or Yeah, so flying training or the flying training system. So the, the Army Air Corps then so i guess we had about 280 ish people in my in my intake and in september intake at sandhurst and i think seven of us got accepted into the army air corps i think one guy did a flying grading uh, an easter flying grading and was unsuccessful on that so he had to then go to another regiment so the, i think so that would have left six of us who then were about to go and embark on flying training but for myself included a couple of us had to still go through flying grading which is the sort of the prerequisite to being a, awarded a, a place on your pilot's course so uh it's three weeks down at middle one up flying uh i think it's tutors not pretty sure it's tutors now at the time it was firefly um but a basic um fixed wing two-seater prop um prop plane and it's a condensed version of the of the first part of pilot's training of the pilot's course and they are just assessing your learning curve and your aptitude to bring, you know, acquire the information. And um, yeah, the, the pressure is on because that's a one-shot deal. If you don't perform well enough at that, then as this other poor lad that, that had been accepted in the Air Corps didn't do well enough on grading, got chopped and binned off, even before he started the pilot's course. Had had happened to him, so I'd, I properly knuckled down, prepared for that, read as much as I could, uh, try to think through, yeah, you because know, a lot of it's about cramming and memory retention. It's, it's, it's monkey see, monkey do to a good to a good degree, but they're assessing your capacity to learn and learn at the right rate. So, yeah, I just thoroughly committed myself to it, passed it, and then that meant. I was now in a position to start my pilot's course. But for me, I had, and, and the, all the guys from my, from that era, um, had six months or so on attachment to an infantry or cavalry regiment. So uh, I got the chance to uh, go to the Paris. I mean, I asked if I could go to the Paris in in my uh, in my interview because that was my my other choice of arm. You get a few a few options of where you want to go, and uh, luckily enough, I was maybe a bit necky, but I. Uh, I asked General Jackson in my parachute regiment interview if, um, even though I'd accepted my air corps place because I did that interview beforehand, uh, and I said, like, you know, I love the idea of just doing an attachment to the parachute regiment for a few months. Would that be okay? And he, he said, Yeah, yeah, well, we can make that happen. That's a good idea because actually, I spent the next nine years in 16 Air Assault Brigade, of which, so obviously, the parachute regiment is fundamental but uh, the Army Air Corps three and four regiments um, uh, which I served with 
uh, were also part of 16 Air Assault Brigade. So it was the, the sort of the premier fast response brigade of the time. And, and you know, General Jackson himself said in the interview, it makes perfect sense if you got a set of parachute wings up because when, when you're sat in that 16 Air Assault Brigade headquarters, you've then got at least a little bit of um, a, a kudos or a little bit of a, an appreciation from all the other staff don't just see you as a flyboy. At least you've actually had, an, you know, spent some time seeing what it's like um, in a parachute regiment platoon. So I got the chance to do P Company and do my jumps course, and then go to to um, Northern Ireland, uh, to South Armagh, and just pretty much spent, you know, a, a bit of time seeing what it was like just patrolling around Northern Ireland uh, with with the parachute regiment and see, and see what it was like from from that side of life, kind of building on everything I'd learnt in Sandhurst and all the lessons and all the leadership and infantry um, development and then actually seeing it for real. That was great, great lesson. Uh, and Did you let on interestingly to any of the paras there that you had a green berry in your locker? I, do you know what? I, I didn't. I didn't think they'd, I don't think they'd care. Interesting. They, um, the, the culture is it's probably it's, it works so well they are everybody is so proud of being uh, an airborne warrior that's all they're interested in and no matter how good a bloke you are if you haven't got your your power wings up they just they will not give you the time of day so luckily I, i'd done p company and done my jumps course by the time i went and did my did my attachment and uh, other you know guys of really high caliber buddies of mine from from Sanders. I remember one guy he uh, he came down and visited us in uh, in Besbrook um Besbrook Mill where we, where we were based and so he went on to become a a colonel in the SAS really high caliber guy hadn't done his jumps course hadn't done P company and the blokes just would not even <laughs> give him the time of day I was like guys colonel who? yeah it's like because at this stage he was obviously a, a lieutenant with having only just done Sandus and he was with uh, another regiment and he just happened to be visiting and it's like guys you, I, I appreciate you've got your culture is is brilliant and I appreciate you, the the pride and the spree the spree de corps for having done something really gnarly makes you and that makes this regiment and that's brilliant but you can't just write off somebody as you know, so black and white you, you're either in that culture and you're awesome or if you're not in that, they're a nobody. So I take every individual on their own merit. And this guy was actually going to go on to do some pretty impressive things, and he's a really good bloke. But don't just mug him off. So that was that was something I found quite interesting. And you probably see that in every little tribal unit all around, not just not just around the military. You probably see that in in all sorts of walks of life. Absolutely, I'm yeah. sure you've seen that. From your, from your oh, you time. see a lot of it in the in the in the police certainly, right? Yeah, and and certainly within areas of specialist operations, there's always yeah. there's cliques, there's levels of elitism, and of course there are those that think there are you know due to the level of training or experience they're different or better than others. But I, I, sometimes I think that does promote um, a level of you know ability that that is is useful at times. Is that that self confidence, isn't it? But uh, I certainly yeah I certainly can relate to that. Maybe not as strongly as it might have been in, in, the, in the military in that sense. But yeah. I'm eager to know, to know at this point, how close were you, having now got to the stage that you were at, how close were you to becoming a pilot in an Apache? Is that still quite a long journey? Yeah, so I, luckily I, I joined at a time where I knew that they were going to get the Apache into service relatively soon, but it wasn't an option to go straight from pilot training onto the Apache. You had to go and do that 18-month pilot's course and then go on to another type, and then very soon, like within a year or two, then if if it all worked out well, you'd then be in a position to to get on the next Apache course. And so f at that point, having just finished my attachment to the Paras, I was three years away from starting the Apache course. So I, I finished finished my attachment to the Paras, went on my pilot's course, went. That's a three phase um, process, pretty much three gusting for the first bit is is just a tri-service elementary flying training flying uh, the basic fixed wing that we'd already done 
um, a bit of time in that flying grading, but it was that elongated over about four months. But um, but the ground school and just some general handling skills. And then that sets you up nicely to then go to the next phase on helicopters where uh, you kinda, you're covering similar ground, but you've got the added complexity of having to you know, learn how to hover a helicopter. I mean, that just, just trying to learn how to hover to start with is, I mean, it's hilarious, it was, but it was, it was brilliant at the same time. But it was, it was hard graft. You just, the first sort of hover lesson dedicated to uh, doing nothing other than trying to just keep this machine in the same bit of space. And you're, you're pouring with sweat, you're working as hard as you can. Uh, instructors just sat there. It's so easy. As soon as you have a bit of a pilot induced oscillation, you can just instantly take control, bang, helicopter's back, solid uh, in a fixed position. Uh, and then he can hand control back to you and the thing is just you know, wobbling about all over the place and you're trying to get used to coordinating everything. Was that over land um, is all I take it? You're hovering over, over the land. surfaces? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just in, in a massive field with no, <laughs> nothing to hit to start with. But uh, it's not long before you can actually get comfortable uh, with being able to do that, uh, hover, hold position, do it crosswind, and have gradually a bit more spare capacity to think about answering radio calls or being aware of other air traffic around you. And you know, later on in the course, you, you'll be in a position where you're hovering uh, with you know, your, your disc, this is the edge of where the rotors are, a few feet away from trees, landing in a confined area, chatting as you go in, uh, and you know, thinking about tactics. But it's all a, a gradual, progressive um, process. And it, at no point do they chuck you in uh, at the deep end to start with and expect you to do loads. It's all building blocks, all really sensibly done. But what there isn't time to do is to revisit anything significantly. You'll get taught a skill. You'll then be expected to kind of nail that to the point that you don't have to be taught it again. Once you've taught something, you need to be able to do it reasonably well. Um, and then they ne you need to then be able to learn the next new skill and so on and so on and just keep compounding and building it. So by the very end of the course, then you can fly you know, in cloud, you can fly at night, you can fly as a formation, you can think not just about physically piloting the aircraft, but commanding it, operating it in a battlefield context. Um, but so that so that second phase of learning the basics of, uh, of operating and flying a helicopter moved on to the third phase at Middle Wallop, which is the same helicopter as it was at the time, the Squirrel. Um, it's now been replaced, but um, it's again that's the operational element where there was lots of night flying. So you introduced the night flying goggles and um, night vision goggles, spending a lot of time going out uh, as either individuals pairs with more than just a flyer route, you've now got uh, things to think about in terms of tactical consequences on route. You've got, got a target, you've got to go and put some reconnaissance on. So it's not, not massively scaled up all the way to full Apache tactics, but it's giving you a hint and it's starting to think beyond, you're not just driving this thing around the sky, you've actually got a, a battlefield purpose towards it. So that 18 month process culminates in getting wings. And for, for me, it was the first two modules um, at f fixed wing and basic rotary, fine, no problem. I was, I was pleasantly surprised I was doing reasonably well, working really hard, but um, doing reasonably well. And then the third phase uh, at Middle Wallop, um, I had a bit of a stinker on one trip. And then as everybody does, everybody's gonna drop a clangor at some point and it, you just, you then have to uh, get you get a reset, and effectively, if you pass that reset, then you're good to go. If you fail that reset, then you you then get put down the air warning system. So you go from air warning two to the air warning, sorry, air warning one. If you fail one trip, if you then re fail that reset, you then get put to air warning two. Now this is a bad thing because you then get a bit of bit of time to regroup consolidate and then and then do a, a retest effectively but the pressure is now on because if you screw that up you're then pretty much one trip away from being chopped if you get chopped that's you off the course never to fly again so there isn't really scope uh to to not keep a 
that that whole learning curve the whole way through without a penalty. And even if you if you cock up, go into air one in one, refly the trip, pass, and then crack back on, you're slightly flagged to the instructors. You're on, you're on the radar a bit more than all the other guys on the course who haven't had a, uh, a bad trip because it's like, well, uh, if you now cock that one up, the microscope is out. What else, <laughs> what else are you going to struggle with? So that made it quite hard. So I failed the trip, got an air one in one, you know, redid it, but I then felt the pressure significantly after that. So all self-induced, clearly. But if you don't, if you don't want it, you don't care well, no big deal. I really wanted it, and as you, you know, as you probably tell, I, I put so much effort just to get on the the course in the first place. Uh, I really, really wanted it. So yeah, I felt that pressure quite a bit, but thankfully got through, got my wings, uh, and then at the end of that, I made a strategic choice to go to a three regiment, um, three regiment army air corps because they were going to get rid of their gazelles and links, and then they're going to re-roll to Apache because it was at that point in time they're only just bringing the Apache in um, to, fr- to frontline regiments. So I knew if I went on to Gazelle and I spent a few months flying, flying Gazelle in, uh, in Wadisham, then that would go out of service from that squadron and then they get re-rolled onto Apache and then by default there was a good chance I could leverage my way onto an Apache course. Also of interest for me was the fact that it was part of 16 Air Assault Brigade, and I wanted to be part of that uh, that you know main spearhead um, brigade. So having done um, the parts course, gone to, got onto Gazelle conversion, uh, turned up at, at the at the squadron uh, and the and the regiment Wadisham. That was just on on max throttle the whole time. Just it's so busy. It was really good, but it was just busyness all the time so I've rocked up straight to Germany for a couple of weeks in the headquarters exercise came back straight in the flying exercise uh, came back to the promotion the captain's course back off that and then we're prepping for a, another exercise but I got the opportunity then and this is this was cool go on an eight week skiing package regimental uh, <laughs> skiing That's package tough. which is which is tough but if, I, if I'm completely honest if I ha- would have had the choice I probably would have carried on flying instead of doing that eight weeks. I'd probably done like a couple of weeks of ski holiday and spent the rest of that time flying because I'd spent all that time learning to fly. Now I wanted to just just consolidate and, and enjoy it uh, without the pressure of knowing that every single flight that you do, you're getting assessed and there's a, a risk you could get chopped out of it forever. Uh, so... But anyway, that was still all the great thing to go and do. Eight, eight weeks straight of skiing. Came back from that and then on to uh, another flying exercise. And then the Apache uh, was due to come in. The Gazelle was due to go out. So at the end of that, they were like, right, you're not on the next Apache course, even though there's no Gazelle cockpit for us on the squadron anymore. So you're going to go on to Lynx. And I'm like, okay, not ideal, but no worries. What do I need to do? to get onto the next available Apache course and what do I need to do to do that? Well, quite simply, go on the Lynx course and do as well as I can and get an Apache recommendation from my time on the Lynx course. Spend a little bit of time consolidating my flying on Lynx, still still within the same regiment, three regiment. And then that should be enough to eventually get me on the next available Apache course in due, in, in due course. And... Um, but no guarantee. But no guarantee. So, yeah, I then did the Lynx course, uh, worked hard, did well, got that Apache recommendation. Uh, but concurrent to that, so uh, I had I had the additional pressure of somebody very close to me having that absolute stinker in life and getting suicidal. I'm pretty close to committing suicide. And I was probably best placed to to be that support and help to eventually talk them out of it and give them all, all the support that they needed to avoid um, being that low again. And that was that took a lot of my spare capacity. Um, and, and of course, that was a priority over and over and 
above passing uh, the, passing the links course and passing it well enough to get um, to get an Apache recommendation because I knew I could revisit that uh, if need be or you know as I've, I'd already proved to myself there are multiple multiple ways to achieve your objective um, so I but I'd been willing to obviously clearly been willing to sideline that because it puts in perspective what's really important were they somebody that you work with uh, no close family member so uh, absolutely vital to me that it, it just obviously yes I love my work and I throw myself into it but it puts things into perspective so thankfully that worked out um, and you know they're still here today so which is great but we as a result of of having got through that and and doing well enough on the links course i then got posted to a link squadron uh kind of spread the rumor that i was going to be on the next apache course uh, <laughs> uh and pestered the adjutant like relentlessly to the point that he he's like look just just to get you off my back i'm going to put you on the next <laughs> apache course uh a couple of the fact obviously that i managed to perform well enough on the links course to get that recommendation meant that I was on the next available course. So only literally six months after that. So I'd spent that period of time uh, as, a, as a flight commander on the links, done a, done a, a series of other sort of promotional um, or um, enhancing qualifications uh, to become a better operator and culminating with becoming uh, an aircraft commander. Then a total of 18 months later, pretty much after I got my wings, I was then on the next Apache course. And as I say, most of the guys who are on the course with me are probably from my sort of era. They hadn't gone straight from, from wings onto the course. So I, I knew a load of the guys on the course already, and we all kind of, uh, you know, it was a good course spirit, and it was yeah, it was great. The first six months, first, it actually wound up being about seven months, a bit of a delay with various things. But that the first half of the Apache course is about learning to fly the aircraft and operating as a singleton initially and then up to a pair. The second half is another six months, again, maybe seven months, which is all about the tactics and weaponeering because that is extremely um, a significant part. And you, you could do so much training on the Apache. You could do a degree on just the Apache. It's a pretty complex piece of kit. So the first half at Middle Wallop, just learning how to fly it, um, it was quite a, quite a privilege to be at that sort of that early stage of, of Apache days because I was only on conversion six, so only five courses had gone before us, and then prior to that, the guys had been learning in America, um, and then coming back and taking what they learnt on the American Apache out there and developing the course from scratch over in the in the UK because our aircraft was pretty similar to the American one albeit just slightly um, different and better engines, but very similar in most respects. Um, but uh, that that first course, I mean, you know, the middle wallop had kind of, the infrastructure was significantly improved. Yeah, we had a, a really nice, um, nice new sim building. The resources thrown at it were, were appropriately um, swept up. And it was so, so nice to be part of that. I was like, eventually, after you know, years of graft, I'm now finally starting uh, on on the the beast um, and getting to fly the Apache for it for the first time. So lots of ground school because it's a pretty pretty complex aircraft, and it's not just about learning everything else that you'd learn on a uh, on a normal uh, aircraft conversion ground school about um, how all the systems work. A big emphasis on the weapons. Um, is that's the kind of the new thing because up, up to that point flying gazelle and flying lynx and obviously prior to that squirrel and, and fixed wing there was there was no weaponing weaponeering or any of that element to it and this is all about flying uh, uh, as a as a flying weapon system it's all about the weapons so that took a took a substantial amount of uh, of learning and they gave us folders that were about you know three or four inches thick and about four or if not five of them so when when stacked up it was literally a couple of foot high and that was the information that we were pretty much taught that was supporting everything that we learned on that conversion uh, 
And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a long and thorough course, but but really rewarding. And again, step by step, you start with just the basics of flying that aircraft by day um, and learning the, the handling skills and just how the thing flies. And then you progress through to flying uh, in cloud on instruments and then eventually you build up to the night flying. And by the end of the course, you're flying pairs on a similar sort of tactical profile and doing various manoeuvres, learning how to respond to emergencies. And you spend a little bit of time in the simulator doing doing weapons just so you've got an understanding. But all that is still to come in depth on the next part of the course, um, on the conversion to roll. But uh, so that went well to start with. And the, the notoriously hard bit halfway through the course is the bag phase, which is where they put the, a cockpit blackout system in place. So you're day flying, but it simulates from your point as the pilot in the back. It's a completely pitch black night. And the instructor sat in the front with no cockpit blackout, with full visibility of what's going on for safety and for, lock, for lookout. But the purpose of it is for you to use the helmet-mounted display that you've got um, projecting an image from a thermal camera to your right eye and it's got symbology and you need to use a combination of the video image from the thermal camera and the symbology and all the information that symbology has given you is everything that traditional old school dials and gauges would give you but all presented quite ergonomically in your eye but you've got to know where to look for it for that information and you've got to know it, uh, it takes a period of time to build up to getting used to that. And it's the same information you'd have in a head-up display on a fighter that's fixed there in front of you. Very similar, that green symbology, all the flight information you possibly need. But it's just because it's presented in front of your right eye, as you move your head around, wherever you look, the information is there. And as you move your as you move your helmet around, obviously the, the thermal camera on the nose of the aircraft moves in a corresponding motion so you always get an image in your eye of wherever you turn your head wherever you're looking then the camera will point that takes a lot of, of getting used to because um, it's the the thermal camera is mounted 10 foot ahead of you three foot below on like a five degree tilt and it's a slightly different magnification about 1.1 1.2 magnification and there's a delay as you move your head. If you move your head really quickly, the camera can't turn quite as quickly. So if you move your head and come back, it, there's a lag in the speed at which that's going to move. So the image in your eye kind of doesn't fully correspond with what you're expecting to see if you don't compensate for that. And also you've got to compensate for the fact that because it's on a, a slightly tilted um, camera axis, uh, or, or sorry, um, the way it's mounted on a five degree um, difference in, when you're sat in the hover, you have to turn your head and tilt your head at the same time to compensate for the fact that uh, as the camera rotates, if you don't do if you don't do that tilt of the head at the same time, it will appear from the the image that you're seeing that you're drifting backwards. So. These things take a long time for the brain to calibrate. Well, it's certainly, yeah. If you're as mint as I am, it takes a long time for it to uh, to calibrate. And I, to me, I was working on the outer edge of what I thought my um, you know, psychology, my uh, my brain capacity was able to to compensate or, or to, to tolerate and to, to work with. But I think everybody found that hard. And the the bag phase is the notorious chopping ground for uh, for that part of the first half of the course. And you know, other mates of mine had come a cropper on that and, and been chopped on that um, subsequent to, to my course. And uh, yeah, you, you can kind of feel the pressure, but thankfully I got through that fine, no problems at all. And I was you know, pleasantly surprised and pretty feeling pretty confident about it. Um, but again, not gifted to me. I was working really hard for it and you know, you, studying in in your spare time even on weekends and throwing as much effort as I could because it still meant a lot to me uh, got through the end of that course as the course kind of wore on though as the night flying came came to um to creep in found that hard found that a real challenge and uh yeah I was kind of 
right on the on the sort of the limit of having to potentially resit a sortie or two. Never it never got to that point, but I was quite close to you know being under the microscope again. So to get to the end of that course relatively unscathed was was good, but came at a lot of effort. Um, so, did you find times when you you genuinely thought I can't do this anymore? Not at that point, no. But in the next phase, yeah, I think so because so that was one of the hardest things I'd ever done in my life, including some pretty gnarly fizz, some gnarly academia at uni. Uh, all that taken into account, the first half of the course was was up there, but by far and away the hardest thing, probably the hardest thing I've still done in my life, was the second phase, the conversion to roll, which is all the all the weapons and tactics stuff, because I was going through that as a, as a flight commander, as a front seat mission commander, and that was incredibly difficult. And that pretty much, that took like, all my capacity, all my effort. I was having, after drawing every bit of, every ounce of self-discipline to, to work as, as much as I could on that. I think potentially with a little bit less pressure by not having been a flight commander um, with all the sort of extra administrative responsibilities by not being um, an aircraft commander being responsible for that aircraft, I think that might have allowed me a little more capacity to just absorb just the the flying instruction. But because I had those extra responsibilities uh, and ex- extra duties that I had to perform on on top of, um, of of simply just being on the receiving end of learning a vast volume of information all that was right at the limit of my uh, capacity to learn and extremely hard there were times I was like well I, I, what more can I do <laughs> but uh, yeah did, did, did that make the fact that when you finally I take it there's a, a, a point where you are you are fully qualified and it not necessarily passing out parade, but there's a there's a point where you're told Chris Rosper you're now a pilot. Here's the handshake, off you go. Yeah, uh, and and the freeing, the feeling. What what did it feel like? Yeah, absolutely right. Freedom is that's the optimum word. I mean, so we, the final phase of that conversion of role because Afghan was was in pretty much um, had been going for about a year or so. Apache had been deployed for. Uh, uh, probably at least a year by by that stage, the final phase of the conversion of role had been adapted from generic sort of Russian doctrine fighting against tanks to um, going out to Arizona and preparing as thoroughly as possible for the next um, Afghan uh, deployment. So we spent a couple of months out in the in the desert doing live firing and doing you know pretty much everything as representative of pre deployment training. Um, for Afghan as, as possible. At the end of that, that was not just conversion to role finished and me now qualified in Apache, but also that was a good chunk of our pre-deployment training for our next tour. But to know that I'd finished that course and passed it and been successful, the the amount of relief uh, and, uh, and the sense of accomplishment and satisfaction was incredible. And that... Yeah, no, nothing. I don't think I'd come close. Get get my degree, get my green lid. Probably came reasonably close to that, but I've n- I've never had to put so much energy and so much focus and effort into doing into passing one thing uh, as that. And then you feel incredibly confident when you when you've passed that. And great. Now the implication of that is I can now consolidate and do so with with a lot less pressure and actually get good at doing this job without the pressure of constant assessment I mean, I never that you you're never not assessed you there's always a degree of of assessment there's periodic six monthly checks and various other standards checks annually and there's certain currency checks you have to do so it never the the pressure of being tested never goes away but it significantly reduces after you've become qualified and there's, there's more than enough non-pressure or low-pressure flying to consolidate your skills so it ups your game that I never had to go through that rigour and that pressure again, um, not on a course. So, yeah. Do you think um, 
So I'd like to touch on on operations, but but before we move to that point, looking back then, so how long did that take from the age of 16 through to age? So I'd have been 27. So yeah, we're talking, that's 11 years of of graft to get. 11 years. And if you look back now, I suppose with hindsight is a good thing, but to look back during those 11 years, what was the biggest lesson? What was the biggest takeaway you could probably take from that? And even give, you know, relay to people now as to what you learned. Yeah. It's um, it's entirely possible to achieve something that is extremely tough, extremely difficult, if you really want to do it and you apply yourself. And that I think that can read across to so many things. Because if you've got that, you're willing to uh, push through the failures, learn from that, move on to the next thing, and keep on plowing on. If you really, really want to, if you've got fixated um, and, you know, if you're fixated on achieving a, a clear-cut objective, it is possible in the vast majority of cases if you really apply yourself. So that's that's the lesson. Do you think that, that of your life today, that even the lessons from then, do they play a part in who you are today? Yeah, very much so. So having the, the confidence to start my own business from scratch and knowing that it's it's not going to be an easy process, knowing that there'll be inevitable um, multiple failures on the way to success, uh, but knowing that by keep keeping with it, keep plugging away, keep working hard, that inevitably you're going to achieve success eventually. So yeah, there'll be there'll be times where it will potentially get really tough, but I've I've endured hardship before. And if I if I dig down deep, then you can get through that. So I think that gives you a certain confidence, certain resilience that you know you can you can achieve. Yeah, I, I can see I that want. in you as well. And from the conversations that we've had, you know, it's it's sometimes it's it's difficult to even relay what you went through. I think to become an Apache pilot because even as, I, as I'm sitting here as you're talking about it, I know it's condensed. It has to be because we're on a time limit. I think most people majority speaking don't go through that level of i think commitment and focus on a role i i I don't think that exists in many environments today to have that level of commitment over such a long prolonged period of time just to reach what you want to do before you even start doing it so i mean huge hats off to you let's just touch on operations for a little bit because you you flew three operational tours of afghanistan yes uh, as an apache pilot yeah Looking across those three those those three tours, that would have been how long? That was pretty much one a year, so zero seven zero eight zero nine, uh, so a four month tour, roughly spaced out as over the over those three years, uh, one one tour per year. But it was a little bit more condensed than that. But we pretty much bounced straight from finishing the conversion to roll course, probably June, July zero seven, and then we were. We'd done part of the pre-deployment training as the final bit um, of of the conversion to role because we did that out in Arizona, and that was that was a really good first half of the pre-deployment training. The rest of that was lots of time in the simulator, uh, lots of time on exercise doing live firing, uh, and I also did the forward air controller course. So a few of us did did that, and a, a brilliant a brilliant course and really enjoyable to do a high pressure course, which for most people would have been you know, pretty high pressure. Um, but being able to do that with, without anywhere near the same degree of pressure that I just, I just experienced on, on qualifying as Apache, it was really cool uh, to be able to do the course and, just, and actually just enjoy it. Because yeah, ultimately, if I'd have failed that course, it didn't, didn't matter and it wouldn't have stopped me going out to Afghan and, and it wouldn't stop me being a qualified Apache pilot. It was just a really nice additional qualification to have because of that. For the first time in a long time, I could actually just enjoy learning a skill with a lot less self-induced pressure. Um, and then that rolled into, as I say, a series of other um, deployments and, ex- and exercises. And you had to work with various other ground units. So you do combined arms, live firing exercises because it was it really it was vital for uh, a lot of the the guys who are going to be deploying um, and being out on the ground on foot of vehicles to to lie fire with Apaches overhead. So literally we'd rock up, 
to arrange where they'd be doing company level attacks and we'd be sat in the hover firing 30 mil live rounds over their head you know, into a tree line a couple hundred meters away because that was as, as much benefit from, from the Apache's crew um, weaponeering uh, and, and training point of view as it was for the guys to be able to say, say that they've integrated with all these different aspects of life. So it would be mortars and be artillery guns and uh, you know, all other things involved, which they needed. Um, but of course, you know, the Apache was, was in big demand in theatre and every other unit you know, dotted around the you know, the army or military at large wanted to get involved with, with the Apache so that they were ready to be able to use it and deploy and op operate with it when they actually went out for their turn in Afghan. So that was really cool. But going out in 07, uh, that I, I remember, so I, I flew, I was flying uh, airborne on the 11th of November, 07, 08 and 09. So every remembrance day for those for those three tours that I did and that was that was pretty poignant so every time I look back on on a remembrance day on um, on the 11th and reflect I know I did three back-to-back -back years flying Apache out in Afghanistan and physically being airborne on, on those days so that that's a pretty special thing to have do you think looking back that people um people's lives were saved as a direct result of, of your actions? Yeah, I think so. Uh, for, I mean, yeah, all of us were a massive a massive team. I think the thing about the, the Apache is, it is a, it's a team effort that is not just co-pilot and pilot or co-pilot gunner and pilot in that aircraft. You'd normally be operating as a wing, uh, or, you know, as in you know, two ship, so before if you're airborne. But then... To get that thing airborne, you've got refuelers, rearmers, and signalers, and IT or you know, mission mission planning station um, information technology guys, and you've got the the remi mechanics, so you know, airframe technicians, avionics, and um, you know, airframes and and propulsion system guys have got to get that that thing serviceable and the, and it's a complicated beast so they're working extremely hard to produce serviceable aircraft and maintain them between flights and obviously it needs to be rearmed and refueled so it's it's a massive team effort to get the thing airborne in the first place then once you're up and you're overhead and supporting uh, ground troops and troops in contact and they're coming under fire by uh, various you know um, enemy force action uh, then yeah, without without a doubt, you you there were numerous times where all of us, um, every single Apache air crew knew that by putting putting accurate fire down and quickly, and by being as as good as we could be at our jobs, we were saving lives for the guys who were who were suffering down there, getting getting pinned down and, and shot up by Taliban. So, yeah, without without a shadow of doubt, lots of lots of time over all three of those tours. Uh, we were in a, that level of that privileged position, but with that responsibility to be as good as we could do to to get quick fire down to uh, you know, either destroy destroy the enemy um, or at least give, even if we weren't in a position to be able to do that, you're in constant radio communication to to the JTACs, so the the guys who are trained to control jets and Apaches. Who will be on you know on the shoulder of the um, officer commanding of whichever ground unit was was operating in that area, and we'd be in constant communication to the to the JTAC and explaining what's going on and giving the benefit of you know that three dimensional um, surveillance that we've got available to us that they can't see any more than a couple hundred meters. They can't see the other side of you know, walls and tree lines and buildings, but we can, or even at night. Could, because we've got really good thermal cameras, we can we can see activity that it just isn't possible to see from ground level. So even providing that battlefield awareness to the to the guys, that in itself, without touching the trigger, just by being savvy and slick with your communication, you're helping to shape where the guys are going to route or get them to suggest somewhere they might want to reposition so they're not going to get outflanked by by some Taliban. 
So on many, many occasions of that, where I'm, I'm sure uh, every single Apache operator has um, experienced the uh, responsibility, and I guess to extent the pressure of making those right calls to save lives. But yeah, without, without a doubt. And then the other, the other big thing, the huge responsibility is getting the either um, the medical evacuation chinooks, uh, which are properly well um, kitted out, and uh, and they've got you know, highly qualified medic staff and, and doctors and uh, and personnel on board to to go and extract casualties. And the responsibility, more often than not, was if it was a if it was a you know, a, a pretty hairy, hot um, danger zone, then Apaches would accompany that uh, that manufacturer, you know, and then you'd therefore be responsible for ensuring that that was able to fly in through a safe route and then um, be on the ground for a minute or two while casualties loaded up and then extract through a safe route and all the while being extremely vulnerable to being attacked on the ground. You need to be as right on your A game, be as good as you possibly can be to, uh, to help, uh, to anticipate where the firing points might be, to, to suggest alternative routes, to uh, be you know, very quick on the radios to to get the approach to be broken off, so that you can reposition, and hold off to to a safe area, just while you rethink um, a route in. If that initial route was was compromised and there were rocket propelled grenades being fired or heavy machine guns, um, so yeah, all these things contributed to to helping to save lives. Yeah, no no doubt about it. And incredibly rewarding to get to do that I bet yeah. you know, really privileged really lucky to get to do that with awesome? all that, that responsibility and pressure how, how did you deal with that personally though when, when you're out of the cockpit now you're back at base the adrenaline's worn down slightly what, what was life like for you then? Lots lots of fizz wherever I could and yeah, obviously just at a basic level that really really helps well certainly it helps it's helped me uh, deal with any kind of stress is just go and do some a really hard fist session and that and that takes the sting out of it straight away and then chat and share any any concerns and thoughts um, but I think you're kind of wound up for that entire four or five months that you're out on tour you kind of you spool up and you and you just reach a level that you maintain for that entire tour and you only really sort of come down off that a couple of weeks into your post tour leave, and uh, because it's fairly relentless, so there's no really, um, there's no sort of days off as such. There's just some less busy days. Some days where you're on duty and you're on quick reaction alert, but you'd never actually get airborne. So by by default, one I think that you you're never massively burnt out, but you're on the on the cusp of burning out after the end of four months but how do you deal with individual things i i don't know i remember so one of my relatively early on engagements in on my third tour it was a, it was a night mission i was just it was a relatively simple thing of just going and escorting a, a chinook into a more dodgy area but uh, in and out simple packs or you know, personnel move and then as the as the Chinook was heading back off to to the safety of being out of the threat zone and, and back to, to to Bastion, we were as we would typically do, and and all other crews I'm sure would would do exactly the same. Is you'd be in dialogue with the the JTACs at various places to, just to offer up any any support that you could, um, just to be efficient with that airframe because when you're when you're a few thousand feet, you can actually you can speak to Many different regions that are only a few minutes flight time away, but they might that might be you know ten miles or so, um, because you can actually your sensors you can you zoom in with your your camera from from a way back and you can offer something even if it's not hang around right over the top for two hours even just by doing a little bit of a, a detour on your on your flyby route back to the base just by being a little bit creative with, with what you got available to you you can give some support so. If it's a case of you, know, you check in, speak to a, a JTAC or all the adjacent ones, do a bit of a dog leg route back, have a sweep through with all the cameras, 
And uh, it just so happened that we got, we got chatting to a guy who was saying that he had suspected um, IED layers, so a roadside bomb being laid at, at night. And we, we got the rough area, and sure enough, the guys were there. There was a whole, whole bunch of, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so, all, all laying uh, or very demonstrably laying um, a roadside bomb. And so we just circled that and radioed that back to headquarters and said, right, actually, you know, rather than just doing a sweep and there's not much going on and a, a bit of a reassuring uh, heads up to the guys, actually, this is this is something we're going to need to loiter for a bit longer and put an engagement in. So I set up for a gun engagement because it was absolutely fine, you know, it was ripe for that. So pilot um, Bill, he'd set us up for a perfect run in. I'd action the gun and I went to pull the trigger, dead gun, fail. It's like, oh, you're kidding me. Reset, try to, you know, deaction the gun, switch it off, switch it back on again, which obviously, like any system, the default <laughs> is even with a 30 mil cannon, switch, a switch off and a switch on again can sometimes clear it. Went through that cycle again. Line back up for a trigger pull and it wouldn't go. So we did that one or two more times and I radioed in and said, look, I'm having problems with the gun. Uh, I'm not entirely happy to put missiles in. Can you spool up the very high readiness and get them airborne that they can they can kind of switch out from us? I'll give them a full handover, but at least they're going to get airborne quite quickly because Bastion wasn't too far away. They can come in, take over from us and they can engage with a gun. And in the meantime, I'm just going to keep reporting, recording, verbally telling the, the JTAC on the ground that we're still seeing, you know, whatever it was, upwards of a dozen fighters, reporting that back to the headquarters, getting all the video evidence, which we could then subsequently show the guys. And then I'd just keep action and de in the gun and trying to make, make the thing work. But I didn't want to put a, a missile in. didn't want to put rockets in for sure. Um, I'm pretty sure we didn't even fly with rockets for, for that tour because they're indiscriminate. And you can only fire rockets sensibly if you've got a big, vast, open amount of space because of the collateral damage implications, because they're, they're not anywhere near as accurate as a missile, even though the missile has got a far bigger, bigger bang to it. Um, so my concern about putting a missile in into that group of guys was that there were adjacent compounds which were inside the... the the frag, the fragmentation envelope of you know, where a missile impact bang on target would have potentially caused damage, if not a low probability of kill, but nevertheless a probability of kill of the occupants of those of those compounds. So I didn't I didn't fire a missile into it. The gun didn't actually work. The VHR aircraft came and took over, by which time, annoyingly, those guys had started to melt away because they'd done their bit. So I went back to base, debriefed the whole thing with the boss, and he got everybody in to that debrief from the squadron. And he's like, right, guys, what should he have done there? He should have put a missile in, shouldn't he? I'm like, um, okay. From my point of view, that was not worth risking the collateral damage implications of the frag envelope um, overlapping where there were where there were adjacent compounds, which would have you know normal people. You don't know they they could all have been just Taliban occupied buildings, but you don't know that from that area. All you can say is you're looking at a TV screen that you can see very obviously fighters digging in a roadside bomb. Therefore, law of armed conflict, rules of engagement. You're entitled to engage those guys because what's going to happen if you don't do that is somebody's going to drive over. Uh, in a vehicle on their next patrol, and they're going to get killed. So that's it's fair game that you you're going to engage with a 30 mil cannon, you know, destroy that target, but not affect all the adjacent um, buildings and, and the people they're in. So I, I actually I wound up getting in trouble, not in trouble, but getting kind of almost chewed out for not putting a missile in. I was like, 
I, I'm actually struggling with this morally now because I don't think that's right to do. I think we've got the intelligence. We know where those those guys are. We know to we've marked and uh, avoid that route. And just until that is dealt with, you know, guys can just when they're out on patrol drive around it and avoid knowing that that's the spot. And yes, we didn't we didn't go and kill that twelve Taliban fighters that night, but they you know uh, the time will come. I. In my judgment, it wasn't worth risking the, the adjacent compounds because you don't know what's in there. But that wasn't within the spirit of the level of sort of um, aggressive posture that, that the OC at the time wanted to have. And I didn't agree with that. And that was one of several things that started getting me thinking that, OK, I've probably done my time now and actually I'm ready to, to move on out of the Apache force. So... I, I can imagine that the uh, you know, that that threat posture and, and and the response, as you say, you know, led by the OC at the time, that would have fluctuated throughout the conflict and depending on circumstances and other things that was happening in the theatre. So, I think the, the the takeaway when I listened to everything you, you've been saying, though, certainly up until that point, it's still down to you ultimately. It's still your personal decision, isn't it? It's no different to coming from a, a police background, from a firearms background. It's, it all comes down to you with all of that training. The decision making is, is squarely on your shoulders. Yeah. Well, as for decision making, then what was that really coming up to the end of the third tour that you're deciding? I think now it's time. I know there was a promotion we can talk about quickly that you're, you're going to move on to the Puma Force within the Royal Air Force. That's something we could talk about. Um, but hold that thought because one thing I'm just interested to know is during that time, those three tours, where where did family come into that? Yeah, in, interesting. So. That was uh, a big game changer for me. It's just before my third tour, I met my now wife at Snetterton Race Circuit on a motorbike track day, and she was on her bike. Uh, and I was, I was like, "Wow, this is the woman for me." I think, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't very very long after that uh, that I went away on my first tour. Sorry, my third tour. Um, but uh, that was a game changer because I, I was for the first time. I'd properly fallen head over heels in love with this uh, amazing woman, and and thankfully, you know, we we, we subsequently got married. But um, yeah, that was a pressure I didn't have for the first two tours. I actually I thoroughly enjoyed uh, those those first two tours of being fully committed, consolidating on my on my flying skills, knowing I was making a, a big difference, getting to do some low pressure flying where there wasn't much on and just getting slicker and better at operating the aircraft. And on the times where things were properly kicking off, knowing I was making a real difference. With all those things, without any any pressure of, of family at home, that some of the the, the guys, some of the older guys, um, were, were married ha- and, and had kids. And that really heavily plays in your mind. So for me, by the time I'd met, met my wife, gone out on the third tour and realised actually... This is an, another reason that I want to be moving on because this is a young single man's job in my, in my eyes, and I wanted to, you know, all of a sudden, not necessarily expecting it, but I just now knew I was going to get married and we were going to you know, try and start a family, and uh, it was time to, to move on. Coupled with the fact that at the end of that third tour, that was going to be probably my last bit of flying um, for some time. I would have gone into a, a staff job, non-flying, for a short period, staff college, into another. A uh, couple of years of non-flying, and then potentially come back as a squadron boss, where you'd still get to do some flying, but you're you know, in charge of the squadron. You're going to be busy um, with administrative and command duties. So, uh, so the consequences of that were going to be lots of moving around, working pretty hard, doing things I wasn't particularly um, enjoying the idea of, and being mostly out of the cockpit. So, the the best plan that we could come up with between um, my wife and I was that if I transferred across to the Air Force to carry on flying um, helicopters, we could go um, and have some stability, live in a nice part of the world in, in South Oxfordshire and have a lot more capacity for life. Because you can probably tell I was running hot that whole time. I was working really hard, no spare time, through everything at the military, all my, all my weekends, yeah, I'd volunteer to be an authorising officer on, on a weekend. I'd be doing weekend air testing. 
um, or I'd be away on exercise or I'd be deployed. So I remember like 2008, I was away for 10 months of the year, for example. It's, I just felt by the time I'd, I'd met, met my wife, done that third tour, I felt, right, actually, it's now time for a, a bit of a step change. It was really cool flying the Apache, really cool operating it um, in, in Afghan. But I've done that now. And I would actually like to have a bit more of a work-life balance. Actually, well, actually have a life. So what would be what would be great would be going to do some lower pressure flying on a different type, a bit more fun, a bit more interesting, and actually having enough time to live, enjoy being in a, in a nice relationship, having evenings and weekends off, um, and having some stability, and then living in a nice part of the world. And and all that was was the case. And it was and it was really nice, but the trade-off was um, it was a lot less cool. And I found it really really hard to motivate myself to get through the Puma course and and be on Puma, having done all the awesomeness that I had, a, you know, the, the chance to go and do on Apache. One of the main things for me was was going from Apache on ops as a relatively like experienced and seniorish captain and then going straight to the bottom of the pile on on the lesser aircraft i don't want to say that uh necessary on camera but that's the, that was the point is the drop off from you apache just, you just did to puma <laughs> sorry but without, i understand you're without not, you're slagging not, off the yeah, raft i, I can um, certainly understand i can i can understand the the, the feelings of having been involved in one thing, moving across to something else that is just as important in its own right, but it just doesn't carry the same, you know, no. either excitement or feelings of achievement maybe as... With, without a shadow of doubt, I, I felt a significant difference in um, level of motivation and the sort of the responsibility, the kudos, the, I'd, I'd worked so hard um, and then I had the privilege to then fly uh, an awesome machine in the Apache and then and to get to operate it uh, on those three tours uh, and actually spend enough time on it to to go from novice to reasonably competent at it. And then the step change in going from that to starting right at the, at the start again as a junior uh, Puma pilot in the Air Force, a different culture, but a bit older... Um, so I was then you know, in a, all my peers were kind of young, early to mid twenties, just starting out on their, on their Air Force career. And of course I was yeah, in my early thirties now, um, about to get married and, you know, hopefully and have a family was the plan. And, uh, yeah, also I'd, I'd gone from already having done something really cool to then, Doing something was a little, a little less inspiring. I felt a bit underwhelmed, and it was that was I was extremely hard, difficult to explain to people because people, well, if you took it in isolation, so well you're getting to get paid a reasonable salary, to have a nice lifestyle, to go and learn how to fly and be taught how to fly uh, to a really good standard, and and get to enjoy flying around. Yes, that's one way of looking at. It. But at the time, I felt it, it was quite a struggle culturally because I'd gone from completely immersed in a, in a really high-profile job to doing something which I felt was quite backward in terms of technology and capability. And that I felt the priorities were, were all a little bit to cock. I'd come from operating um, a, a fighting system, a weapon system, where I could actually really make a difference on the ground to then being back in a sort of quite dry academic environment where the priorities were all completely skewed in my mind. And suddenly, you know, losing 10 foot on a quick stop manoeuvre was, was more important than, you know, be able to put down accurate fire and give a really good situational report on the, on the radio to a JTAC, which might save lives. Uh, and that was, that was tricky. I had to dig really deep for the first time ever, I'd been so motivated to achieve all the other things I'd done up to that point. But now here I was doing something that I really wasn't that focused on or that fussed on. 
So that was a real struggle. But the trade-off was, of course, I was now getting the chance to to spend time with my wife, and or you know, we subsequently um, got married, and then uh, you know enjoyed uh, a nice married life together. But uh, it it wasn't as clear cut as perhaps you know it, it it would first appear from the outside. And also at the same time, we were I made this made that decision to come across to the air force to have a more stable and, and easier life, so we could start a family. So we um, were, were trying for kids soon soon after we got married, uh, and then after a while sadly you know no no success there so we tried IVF and then the first round didn't work so we then tried it again uh, and no success and then um pretty much the you know the doctor said sorry that's that's it yeah you guys aren't aren't going to be having kids so that was that was a really tough time because my my life direction had completely changed it was no longer doing just what I wanted and, enti- and entirely going off and only thinking of, of how I was going to live my life. It was all about how can we live a nice life together and start a family together. Uh, and and sadly, that you know, it didn't work out having kids. Um, but you, you know, you count your blessings. And I'm extremely lucky. We still we got a, a, a you know lovely, happy marriage. And uh, it's how you respond to external factors that are beyond your control nothing we could do about it we did the, you know everything we could um some things don't go quite as you as you'd want but uh so that was a tough time but i think a combination of things led me to think actually my time in the in the military is done because if i want to go and do something that's really cool and high tempo and i really enjoy and i, I want to get my teeth into that's going to come at an enormous cost of effort and being moved around and you know and Claire wouldn't wouldn't enjoy that actually I think I've got a better plan here I'm going to leave I'm going to set my own business up and I'm going to do all the things that I really want to do mainly focused around motorsport but then I'll still bring in all the best elements and the cool things that I've been lucky enough to do in the military and then put that into just one awesome package that and I get to do it on my terms and uh and I get to you know retain the the harmony of a of a, a nice marriage and you know a loving marriage so uh and that was by 2014 I then spent the next 6 years really up to this point kind of gradually building up my company and building up Vforce and building up the skill set and the network uh, and put in all the groundwork. So and I was lucky to be able to phase out Air Force life as I was starting to blend in all the things that uh, that I subsequently took um, as fundamentals for V Force, starting with with motorsport. So I I got got a rally car, got my rally license, um, and same for racing. Uh, and then I started competing. And then after a few years of competing, I became an instructor. Uh, as both a, a rally and a racing instructor at, at two different areas, and then uh, and then got part time work still as I was blending out of my RAF career, uh, and then in parallel to that, so I did a uh, an unarmed combat Krav Maga instructor course. I did a close protection course, um, and then I was just trying to network in and upskill as as much as possible to to make this package um, that uh, that I felt that that V-Force could be, which is everything I'd love to do and none of the drawbacks. Um, uh, and thankfully, that's that's all taking shape really nicely. So I, I left the Air Force a couple of years ago and I've been full-time committed to developing V-Force now. And uh, as I say, part of that has been uh, associating with, with some really high-caliber people who've then come as as part of the team to to support me and and are part-time instructors and are able to uh, be available to help me shape some really good driving skills courses and uh, and then that I'm sure will expand out into further coolness when we're going to involve aviation uh, and other great um, flying machines 
Um, well, you, you've sold me on the concept already. Because <laughs> uh, I must say, at yeah, this stage, thanks. as as I, as I was guilty of in episode one, uh, we are, we have run out of time. Uh, I think we we're both agreed as well, though, that in the future we're looking at an episode two where we're going to certainly concentrate more on, I think maybe some of the transitions out of the the air force as well into business life, um, and focus heavily on V force training. But we can certainly just summarise now. I think. Um, what is V-Force training, if, if you were to talk to me now as a complete, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, yeah, about your so business. I'd summarise it by saying it's advanced and tactical driving experiences that are mainly focused on experience day customers. So any member of the public can come do it, like a, a red letter day. Uh, but also uh, it's for corporates um, and uh, for uh, professional close protection guys, uh, even police or military uh, who want to upskill their their tactical and advanced driving? And I've arrived at four different courses, each of which uh, will will um, teach and then consolidate on uh, specific driving skills. So I've got uh, an evasive driving course which uh, works around ordinary cars. So I just use Ford Focus, so front wheel drive manual cars doing um, J turns and handbrake turns, uh, and then the the final exercise that that consolidates and brings everything together is uh, has a tactical overlay so you're actually going out on a simulated um, undercover undercover surveillance operation where you get bounced you've got to react to threats you've then got to apply all those uh, evasive maneuvers under pressure that's evasive driving that's one the next one is rapid response driving so you're using a slightly more powerful rear wheel drive manual car and you're learning how to power slide and or drift one of a better description, uh, and handle a rear-wheel drive car at and beyond the limit. And then the the tactical element of that is to uh, then go into a sort of hostile environment and extract a wounded operator. So one of you's driving, obviously with an instructor in the passenger seat, and then in the back you've got a second operator to then rescue the wounded operator and conduct... Uh, any kind of medical treatment whilst extracting that operator to safety and to add some little spice into it, you're being followed and chased up by an aggressor uh, in another car or whatever other vehicle uh, just to add some pressure. Then we've got a third, which is uh, rally interceptor driving. So interceptor skills using uh, a four-wheel drive turbocharged Subaru and uh, you're working that a high-performance vehicle on the loose and driving that as well and as quickly as you can using rally driving techniques to the, to chase down hostile vehicles. So we combine the two. So you're chasing down the uh, the BMWs that are being driven to go and extract the uh, the wounded operator, uh, and then you then got the option to dismount and then potentially put down some simulation paint rounds um, as a as a, an aggressor force. And then we have a, a separate fourth course, which is which I call vehicle gunnery, and that is SUV based. But we can pretty much operate between various different vehicle types. So it's mainly um, SUV or four x four vehicles, and that is all about um, operating from the gunnery perspective. So you get given simulated uh, weapons, so M16s and, and and pistols that are paint firing, and you're shooting a variety of targets. Instructor does all the driving, but the emphasis is on being able to engage targets as you're driving around, um, either static targets uh, or uh, simulating a car chase and culminating uh, in, a, in a full-on car chase where guys are firing back at you and you're firing at them. So that's so all very cool. standard day at the office, I think. Standard day at the office. Yeah. So if anyone's great. listening to this right now and they're desperate to jump on board one of your courses, where would they find you? So vforcetraining.com. So just a Google search, vforcetraining.com, and that'll take you straight to the website, and then all the course details are there, dates, prices, different types of course, really easy. Uh, or you can find us on Instagram, and uh, so vforce um, driving experiences, uh, but we're also we're on Facebook as vforce training. Uh, but any of those routes will take you through. And I heard a little birdie told me that there was a 10% discount up for grabs for anyone listening to the podcast. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, absolutely right. And how, does somebody, how does somebody go by getting a 10% discount? Yeah, so just apply um, no excuse 10. 
to the to the booking and that's really easily done and really easy seen on the website fantastic well, that's brilliant um ep- episode two does mean that i might be behind the wheel you do realize that i'd be delighted if you fantastic. would yeah like, come on let's let's go and have let's go and have a fun day out just yeah ragging we might cars spend a few around. hours doing a podcast but the rest of the day we're going to do some driving yeah yeah. It's been a great pleasure, uh, Chris. Look, for everyone listening, Chris Voss, a former Army Apache pilot, um, I could talk to you for days, which might be a problem because <laughs> I failed then to ask the question. So it's been a great pleasure to listen to, to your story so far. Really keen to talk about that transition that you had from leaving the Royal Air Force into military life and some of the things and experiences around that. But for now, um, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's been awesome. I don't know how, how else to say this other than say goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you, mate.